new month has arrived and with it a new version of Home Assistant. At the time of the recording, this is 2022.5 Beta 5, but by the time that you see this video, full release will already be out. So let's look at some of the main things in new release of Home Assistant. At first, when you boot up the latest release or new release of Home Assistant, and that is the main release, it may look that there are not a lot of changes, but there are a bunch of them and not everything is under the hood. We'll start with configuration menu. Yes, unfortunately, when you record something on the beta version of software, you have to expect changes. And one of the changes from beta 5 to beta 6 is that now we do not have any configuration menu anymore. It's now called settings. If you notice, the configuration menu does now look a bit different. For example, devices and services now also include helpers. So you have integrations, devices, entities and helpers in one place. If we go to automations and scenes and scripts, here you will find also blueprints. Areas and zones are together. Add-ons are also in a separate tab. We now have a system tab, where most of the things where you could configure something has been moved to. For example, general, this is the basic information about your system. Updates, here you will find all the updates. And by the way, if you are looking for the updates that you skipped, just press on three dots and show skipped. Let's try it here. If we, for example, select this one, press skip, we will not be seeing it here in the configuration menu, but in the system, updates, and if we click three dots, we can now show everything that skipped. And by the way, yes, you can also clear skipped. It will then be returned to the list of all available updates. When we are already on topic of updates and skipping updates, there is a new service call. Let's go to developer tools, services, and we now have something called clear skipped update or update.clear underscore skipped. But it's not all as it seems. You cannot clear every update that was skipped. You have to provide target for it. And that means that if you want to clear the skipped flag, you will have to either use some kind of value template to clear everything, or you will have to name the exact name of the update that you want to clear the skipped flag off. Logs is now a place where you can see all the log files from Home Assistant, and that includes core, supervisor, host, DNS, audio, and multicast. And that way you will now be able from one place to search through all the log files. Backups, of course, are used to create or restore backups, at least in Home Assistant supervised or Home Assistant OS version. Analytics is where you configure all the analytics related stuff, basic analytics, usage, statistical data, and diagnostics. Don't forget, I know, everyone is concerned about privacy, but by allowing Home Assistant developers see what you are using in Home Assistant, that can A, prevent something from being removed, and we all remember the panic around the Raspberry Pi GPIOs, but also can push Home Assistant to push developers of either integration or some other component or device to make a support or to improve support for the device. So analytics, while it may seem that they are not important, yes, Home Assistant crew is using them during negotiations with various vendors. So if you can enable them, it will be beneficial both to you and Home Assistant as a product. Network is a place where you can see all the information about your network. Storage will list all the storage that is available, plus in the three dots, you can move your data disk. Hardware will give you information about hardware. I am running this in OVA or virtual machine. And system health will give you information about your system. Version and installation type, community store, integrations, cloud, supervisor, etc. But it looks like something is missing. And what is missing is the part on reloading specific parts of Home Assistant configuration. For example, all the input booleans, text fields, etc. Or reloading automations. If you notice, here in the configuration, on the right side, we have restart button. But where did all the reloading stuff go? If we go to developer tools, there is now a new tab called YAML configuration. 
If you click on it, you will see that everything from configuration validation to reloading is now here. You can check configuration, restart your system, and of course, reload all the stuff that you previously could also. Everybody knows that pressing letter E will pop up the entity filter. But what if you are on your mobile phone? Now you have search tab that will pop up this same entity filter, and there you can search for entity. A lot of you are using gauge cards. But what has changed is that it can now be segmented and much better than it was possible previously. Here you see the standard normal gauge card. And this one, as you can see, is improved. For example, this is for my 3D printer. Everything below 80 degrees centigrade is too low for printing. From 80 degrees to 95 degrees, it's okay, but you should avoid. While on the other hand, if the bed is heated between 100 and 110 degrees, that's okay for printing ABS. Of course, everything about it is also a problem because there is a possible short fire or some problem. So now you can create much better looking gauge cards. There is one note. In order to do that, at least for now, you have to go to YAML. If we edit the card, show code, you see that you have to create manually segments. Segments go from value, meaning from 0 to something, from 80 to next number from 95 and from 105. That way you can create your custom gauge card. But this is not all in regard to changes. A lot of the changes were in the automations and scripts part. Unfortunately, I cannot go in depth with all the changes because this video would probably be at least hour or hour and a half long. First, and one of the biggest change and something that I know that a lot of people will be using is if then else if then else is normally used in most of the program. If something happens, do this, else do something else. By using conditions, you were also able to do that, but using if then else simplifies this. The example that is provided with documentation is that if no one is at home, means that state zone home is equal zero, so no person or no entity is at home, then start vacuum. Else means that somebody is at home, skip vacuuming. So, for example, you can have trigger at ATM to trigger the vacuum. An action will be either start vacuum if there is nobody at home, or else if there is somebody at home, skip it. There is a new trigger, and this trigger is calendar, and it will simplify the way that people do automations with calendar. After selecting calendar, you can then use event start or event stop to trigger or do some action. If you like to repeat things, and repeating is good, repetitio est mater studiorum, now you have option to use for each. In this example, for each, and it's configured to have two languages, so languages English and languages Dutch, there is a different message for each of the languages, we run service notify, and it says in the title message in language, so message in English, it will give you message in English and message in Dutch, it will send you message in Dutch. So what this can be used for? It can be used to repeat some tasks. There are other reasons maybe for you to opt out using for each instead of counting or something similar. One of the nice features is continue on error. For example, let's look at automation. If you, for example, have automation that's called midnight and you start some sequence of events. If now any of the services fails, Unfortunately, everything behind it will fail. For example, let's say that I start with notification. This notification is pushed to my mobile phone, saying something like it's midnight, lights out. The next thing is slowly dimming the lights. If service call to notification would fail, unfortunately, there would also be no call to lights off. That way, even when some minor service has failed, such as send notification, the main service and the goal for that automation would also fail. Now you have option to use continue on error true, and that way you can skip through some of the services that you think are not that important or that you can live with if they fail. And yes, unfortunately, this is currently only available in YAML. If or when it will be available in the UI editor, I don't have that information for now. Stopping a script. Well, this is great case for if then else. If the condition is not met, now you can use stop action to stop any and further scripts or automation. This improvement can be used both in the UI and YAML. 
and as I mentioned, it is a great way to combine it with trigger IDs, with conditions, or with if then else, which was added also in this release. Home Assistant runs all actions in sequence, meaning one service call starts, when it finishes, it goes to the next, etc. We already said that this version brings continue on error, which allows you to skip on errors and continue running the services. But what, for example, if you need, for some specific reason, to run parallel services? Until now, this was not possible. We now have option to run actions in parallel. Let me give you a case. Each midnight, I receive notification on my phone. Midnight lights out. I also push notification to my LG WebOS TV, saying the same thing. And of course, the third option is in the living room, I receive text-to-speech via Google speakers, midnight lights out. Next, or the last step, of course, is slow dimming and then turn off all lights in my apartment. Now, I am able to push all three notifications by using parallel action. And that means that at the same time, now I will receive notification on TV, mobile phone and text-to-speech. Before, it was going one by one. But be careful, if you run in a sequence actions, you can share variables or you can have results of the previous action. When using parallel actions, as they are processed in real time in a parallel, those services cannot use the results or variables from the other service. Meaning, if you, for example, first run something that calculates a number, random number, then later on use action that has to use that number, no, you cannot do that in a parallel. And that means that the parallel is not for every activity. Be careful and think of if the service has to run in a sequence or if it can be a parallel action. There are some additional improvements. For example, this one allows you to match state condition. If either condition is state, these are the entities match any on. Means that if any changes state to on, this condition will be met. This is, for example, great if you are building your own alarm system. And by the way, if you haven't seen, mostly Chris has released a video on how to build your own alarm system. Go check it out. One of the things that I'm really hyped about is this one. Added support for not from or not to. Why? For example, my vacuum cleaner. It becomes at least once a day at around 3 a.m. unavailable. And when it changes to a state unavailable, yeah, I get notification. This means that now I can improve of my automation and add as a trigger platform state entity will be name of my vacuum and not from unavailable or unknown. That means that I will receive any notification or change in a state of the vacuum, either be it returning home, cleaning, docked, recharged, or whatever, unless it is unknown or unavailable. And believe me, there are days when my glitchy Unify network just decides to disconnect my vacuum 20 times a day, and me and my wife receive notification that the state changed to unknown, and later on that it is docked. With this, I will simply prevent messages like that. There is now possibility to disable specific trigger, action and condition. It can be great, for example, to disable something temporarily. For example, let's say that you have automation that has trigger that is only relevant when it's winter. And when it's spring, summer or fall, you don't need it or even it messes up something else. So now you can disable it by adding enabled false. And that way, that part of the trigger will still be in the automations but it will not be executed. And where is need for that, you can then enable it and allow system to also trigger on that. Shorthand notations for logical conditions have been added, and that's and, or, or not. Also, one of the simple but very powerful addition is to allow selecting multiple entities for state trigger. So, for example, I can use this as a trigger, in this case, to check if multiple lights change to on. You don't have to create multiple triggers. Now you can only create one trigger with list of those entities. From other changes, there were additional optimizations to database. In this release, also two new integrations have update entity implemented. Also, in this release, template selector has been added. 
you can now use template editor both in automations and scripts. And this one will really help you if you are building custom templates by using or by being able to select the entities you have. The list of other not worthy changes is very long. For example, script now automatically gets unique ID. So if you have custom scripts, don't forget to also add a unique ID. If you have seen my previous video about Home Assistant Core or Docker version and the backup, this release brings backup create. And that means that you can finally create automation that will fire up your backups. By the way, yeah, restores are not part of the backup for Docker and Core. If you are interested in that, I can create additional video on how to restore something in a Docker. But unfortunately, for now at least, this will be manual process and there is no restore command. And of course, there are a lot of breaking changes. Don't forget to check this list for each integration that you are using. For example, for IKEA Tradfree, the native IKEA groups have been removed. You should now use light groups instead. Additionally, YAML configuration has been deprecated and after updating to the latest version and after this is imported, you can remove or at least for now comment out the section about IKEA Tradfree. A lot of changes has been down to minimum and maximum and if there is interest, I may release a new video on this as there are a lot of changes. This change for the minimum and maximum sensor has been implemented so to reduce disk space and database. And if your system is using minimum maximum sensor, check the release notes. Arlo, digital loggers and updater have been removed. And this has been brief, but really not brief, overview of what's new in 2022.5 or May release of Home Assistant. As there were a lot of changes with automations and scripts, I didn't want to go into too much details. So if you are interested, for example, in something specific, for example, if then else, drop me a line below and I can make a separate video on it. What is your best feature of May release? For me, definitely the improvement of gouge cards. I do like configuration changes, although it will get some time to get used to the change and where the reload button is now located. And of course, I love both running parallel actions and ability to select multiple entities as triggers. If you did like this video, don't forget to give me a like. If you have any kind of a comment or a question in regard to this video or any previous video I did, you can leave comment down in the comment section below or even better go to Discord server and leave comment there. And of course, I want to thank everybody who is supporting me and who has become YouTube channel member. Thank you all for all of your support. But also thanks to everybody who watched, liked or subscribed to this channel. If you too want to support the channel, you can do so by clicking the join button down below. And I will be seeing you next time. Until then, bye bye and have fun.